welcome you all for Keats' letters to Benjamin Bailey, an overview. John Keats. Keats was a great romantic lyric poet in England. He always aimed for perfection and loved to explain philosophy through classical legend. After losing both parents at a young age, he went on to study medicine and earned his apothecary license, entitling him to work as a surgeon. But he was determined to write poetry instead. John Keats died in 1821 at the age of 25, still believing, I have left no immoral work behind me, nothing to make my friends proud of my memory, and insisted that his friends inscribe on his gravestone. Here lies one whose name was red in water. Thus, Keats would have been as surprised as to find himself in the company of other romantic poets. The letters of John Keats offer interesting insights into his thought patterns, both as a man and as a poet. Though Keats is known for the luxurious and sensational quality of his poems, only his letters revealed the depth to which he had thought about poetry and life. It is believed that his judgment of poetry to be so genius for a young man like Keats. His letters have had a very eventful journey, being for the first time collated by Richard Monckton Milnes, who is also known as Lord Houghton in 1848. Still then, his letters were not published for reasons of dishonoring his privacy. Lord Houghton was an English poet and a politician who strongly supported social justice. Keats' letters are a journey leading the reader from one idea to another and helping him to understand the poet's works in a manner that is extraordinary. To the letters of John Keats, we owe several phrases of literary actions. For instance, the holiness of the heart suffocations, what the imagination sees us as beauty must be truth, pleasure thermometer, negative capability, and egotistical sublime, and many others as well. Keats had several correspondents, namely his friends, his fellow poets, authors, his publishers, his rivals, his family consisting of his brothers and younger sister Fanny, apart from the more intense correspondence with Fanny Braun, his beloved. The letters to his younger sister Fanny were not only touching, but also provided sensitive illustrations. When the recipients read them, they could imagine in what mental state Keats was, could visualize the place where he was sitting to write the letter, what clothes he was wearing, and what the general atmosphere of things around him was. He kept in mind what he imagined their reaction would be. Keats' method is similar of today's email system, by the use of which one expects a foster reply from the other side of the line or within a short period of time. Thus, the letters offer sensitive inroads into the psyche of one of the greatest poets of the English language. The relationship between Keats and Benjamin Bailey. Benjamin Bailey was a student at Oxford University where he became friends with Keats. Reverend Benjamin Bailey was born on 5th June 1791 in Lincolnshire and now it is called as Cambridgeshire. He entered Oxford at the age of 25 in 1816. Reverend Benjamin read for holy orders in the sense in Catholicism. Holy orders is the ritual by which men are ordained or ordered officially as priests or deacons. Holy orders is a commitment for life, both to God and to the Catholic Church. It can only be given by a man who has himself undertaken all three rites and has therefore become a bishop. Thus, Benjamin Bailey was passionate about theology and philosophy and was an ardent admirer of Dante, Milton and Wordsworth. Bailey met Keats in 1817 and shares his room on Oxford campus with him. Bailey was naturally prejudiced in favor of him on account of his poems. Keats describes Bailey as one of the noblest men alive at the present day. It was at this time as housemate of Benjamin Bailey. Keats wrote the third book of Endymion, a poem which is divided into four books, 
each approximately 1,000 lines long. The Biography of Benjamin Bailey In 1819, Bailey married Hamilton Gley, who was the daughter of a bishop. In 1827, due to her failing health, he decided to move from England and secured an appointment in a small church in Marshallis, a city in France. In 1829, the Bishop of London arranged for the Baileys to migrate to Ceylon. He is a senior colonial chaplain. Ceylon is the present-day Sri Lanka, a country in South Asia. His wife died in 1832 and was buried in St. Peter's Church Fort. Bailey spent 20 years in this country being appointed as Archdeacon of Colombo in 1847. Colombo is the largest city in Ceylon. Bailey was a poet who wrote copiously. His writing, whether religious, translations, poetry or prose, was prolific by any standards. He has written mostly sonnets on many places of Ceylon and situations and sites. He did not touch on the people, only nature, and never on politics of the time or on colonialism in his sonnets. He dedicates his first poem about Ceylon to his dead wife. His unfortunate death at the age of 62 deprived not only the church, but also the reading public of an outstanding intellect. His friends in Ceylon erected a memorial stone to his memory in the grounds of St. Peter's Church Fort. Letters to Benjamin Bailey Keats had written almost 10 letters to Benjamin Bailey out of 240 surviving letters on various dates. Given here are the dates of letters which were written to Bailey by Keats. These letters serve as great literary treasure of critical interest and aesthetic philosophy. These letters also provide an excellent window into his poems, revealing his thoughts on poetry and creative writing process. Let's have a discussion of the philosophical and critical concepts of his famous letter dated 22nd November 1817. This letter shows genuine concern for Bailey. In this letter, Keats attempts to resolve the clash or the tensions between Bailey and Robert Hayden. Robert Hayden was the mutual friend of Bailey and Keats. Bailey was once offended by Robert Hayden, and Keats writes this letter to pacify Bailey and stresses on the importance of understanding human character and discusses his own standpoint. This letter also traces prolific development in his poetic philosophy and his findings of poetry as an aesthetic art. The belief that beauty is truth, as expressed in Keats' letters, has now become the testament of romantic aesthetics. Human heart, according to Keats, incorporates immense compensation, love, and the truth of imagination. Keats then refers to his ailment by relating it to imagination and expects to see all his troubles end. Keats stresses the flexibility of poetical mind that can accommodate itself to whatever structure it is put into. Keats is also conscious of the fruits of imagination. For this, he hints at the creator and the divine past. Imagination, Keats says, is like Adam's dream of Eve. After waking up, Adam found it to be true. Keats writes, wish should be so patent in its desire that it should become true. The basic idea behind Keats' philosophy is the equation of imagination with truth. Keats believed that beauty can be derived through the imagination, and this experience can be termed as truth. The process of imagination can create an alternative reality for the poet, which is of the highest order. Keats then feels that intense feelings of love or beauty does not ever die. It is like if one hears an old song in a delightful place by a delightful voice, it carries the same spirit of joy in one's heart when they hear it again in some other situation. But provided they keep the same intensity of feeling attached to it that they felt in the beginning. Keats further emphasizes that at the height of ecstasy, the preliminary image lies with the person and can be seen even afterwards whenever the same experience gets repeated. According to Keats, the mind is capable of carrying those virginal imprints of the powerful state. Keats says, same would not be applicable to the complex mind, which is imaginative and careful of its outcome, who would exist half a sensation and half one thought. 
Let me expand this quotation. By sensation, Keats means the felt or the experienced part. By thought, he may mean something at the level of superficial fancy. Keats feels that Benjamin Bailey has a complex mind as he has discussed. He suggests Bailey to know God first, besides knowing everything about knowledge. Keats further says that he can feel himself into anything, whether it is the setting sun or the sparrow that comes to his window for food. He says he beholds and lives in that object in that particular moment. Keats then suggests Bailey to remind him if he is numb but some corner of his heart for human reasons and not the abstractions. If they are abstractions, he must forgive Keats because sometimes for weeks his mind does not feel affected by any human passion and that he is lost into deep musings. The letters showcase him to be a man of tolerance where he is striking a balance between life and aesthetics. This letter to Keats, intimate friend Bailey, is replete with profound philosophical and critical concepts. As T.S. Eliot puts it, his letters are the most notable and most important ever written by any English poet. Thank you.